Growth hack your brand and then destroy anything that moves. You need to grind hustle your platform manifest. It's all about entropy, elegance, and finance. Blockchain. Invest in real estate every day. Invest in real estate every morning. You need to mind hack the mind shackles that are grabbing your mind. Entrepreneurs. 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 Entrepreneur. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a day. Eat the man who just fished and you'll eat for a lifetime. Bartons! Business Money Hacks. Hi, welcome to Business Money Hacks. My name is Dustin Taylor Hahn. And I am Bridge Stewart. And today we kind of have a uh, very unique, very interesting episode. Yeah, a lot of interesting things going on in the world right now. So. A lot of things are happening. We have a virus that's spreading. And we also have a campaign that's going on. So that's sort of fun. That's right, Bridge. You are running for president. How is that going? How, how's the campaign trail going? Um, It's, it's, it's going okay out there um there's a lot of challenges we've started a little late in the game um is that right you know there's a there's a giant virus happening but uh other than that it's going great you ended up getting a bus right i mean you were really excited about getting that bus oh yeah that's one of the main reasons i wanted to do this whole thing um i've got a huge bus i got the best bus it's bright red driving through this country this great country of ours interior is completely leather it's all minx leather um usually with minx uh leather it's it's pretty hard to procure a little bit of that i got a lot of it costed a pretty penny so outside all red inside all minx interesting you mentioned that you really wanted a jacuzzi do you have a jacuzzi on the bus that's that's the big question the jacuzzi oddly enough you put a lot of cream in that jacuzzi uh you fill it with with 100 percent whole milk cream and that thing doesn't work quite as well so we've had some issues with the uh the cream jacuzzi we've had to fill it with water unfortunately which i'm not nearly as interested in so that's been a little bit of a uh, that's a been down. the main disappointment on this campaign trail is the fact that the cream jacuzzi isn't quite working as well but um you know we make do i guess uh, simon was right we had an episode with simon he talked about transportation and where the world was going and he says it was all buses big fan big fan of buses more buses the better i say i think everyone should have a bus <laughs> instead of a car just a just driving around in buses just everyone driving their own bus without anybody else on it. There's nothing like the silence of an empty bus. I think that's very uh, very therapeutic. So let's talk about the, the guest we have on. Now, we, we have a, a very, very special guest, and you've heard him before. Sir Spalding O'Henry has uh, graced us with his presence uh, out on the, the camp. Well, I'll let you explain, Sir Spalding. Uh, can you guys hear me all right? Yes, I hear you. Oh, excellent, excellent. I'm out here on the campaign trail, so, you know, things get a little spotty in terms of uh, my satellite link. Um, but thrilled to be here with you guys this, today. R you know, we're out here on the campaign trail. You know, Bridge Stewart for President 2020. Yep. I'm very excited to have had the opportunity to join Bridge as his campaign manager. So uh, it, it, we're out, out here pounding the pavement here on the campaign trail. So you're out despite everything that's going on the, with the virus. Absolutely, absolutely. We are not slowing down because the coronavirus, the corona no scare, the corona scam, as I've been calling it, <laughs> We feel really strongly, in fact, that this is a big opportunity for the campaign. Yeah, people people keep saying, oh, no, the, the coronavirus trouble. It really is an opportunity. You got to take advantage of a big virus. And I think, Spalding O'Henry, you really realize that. Thank you. I appreciate Absolutely. I mean, we were already entering this race pretty late in the game. And from our yeah. perspective, that gives us an advantage. That's a surprise. We're going to surprise the voters by, by kind of coming in at the last moment and getting on top of them in that way. And then when the coronavirus hit, right as we were surprising the voter, uh, that sort of threw everything into the mix. And we thought, oh, we should stop. We should slow down. We should back off, you know, six feet of separation, all of that. And then a light bulb. No. What if we didn't? What if we went harder than ever? Right now, in the midst of this pandemic, we were the ones that were out there rallying the troops and of course that i think was a very inspired move albeit we we have run into a few um minor bumps in the road sh couple shall we hiccups. say couple, a couple 
s- sneezes, coughs, I guess. A few, yeah, to continue this pandemic metaphor, I suppose a, a couple sneezes in the road. Uh, namely, it's been it's been quite the challenge to get people to show up for a lot of these campaign events, these rallies. The, we have had, we definitely have seen people be a little spooked off, uh, yeah. which has been a surprise. I mean, uh, especially because I guess technically it's illegal to have big like groupings of people. That ain't stopping us. Yeah, that's um, something we've run into a few times. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'll just show up to a you know a big convention center and give my speech, and the and you know the convention center is locked up. I mean, all this stuff is shut down, so we have to break into the convention center and start giving our speech. Our entire staff is equipped with bolt cutters that they can use at any time to get us into any one of our venues that. We've been told we cannot meet at. So, Sir Spalding, are you are you with the staff now, or how close are you with the staff? Uh, geographically, no. We, I mean, we've got we're on the campaign trail all over. We've got teams all over the country. You know, yeah. from Maine down to Florida. I'm in Toronto right now, um, really pounding the pavement to get the word out about Bridge to it, You're President Tor- of the United States, 2020. Say that again. you're in Toronto. I'm in Toronto. Yes. Um, hitting the hitting the streets of Toronto. This is it, uh, this is the best way that we can try and get this American presidency rolling. Is is hitting those Toronto streets. Well, again, it's part of our strategy of kind of doing what everyone else isn't doing. You know, it's the, the, no other American candidate for president has come to Toronto. No, not one. We've also sent people to the Maldives. We've sent people to the British Virgin Islands. Um, that was my idea as well. Uh, I went to so, Iceland. Those Icelandic people, they love this stuff. I think that's really getting us exposure, places we wouldn't normally get exposure. Yeah, that's the challenge. That's the challenge, I, I suppose. That's the that's the corona challenge. I was saying a, a lot of the young kids, they, you know, it's very popular on, on platforms to, to be doing a, the challenge. What's the new challenge? The ice bucket challenge, you know. So it's like the Corona challenge would be getting as close as you want to somebody um, and and trying not to cough. Yeah, and violating their personal space has been a really uh, that was something we thought what would go viral, what would be a fun a fun campaign boot bump, and that we thought oh Corona challenge, let's flip this on its head, get as close to someone as possible. It's tough to for me not to cough. A campaign like this, I mean, it's it's a big endeavor, and so a way I like to sort of you know relieve stress is is smoke a lot of cigarettes. I smoke about three packs a day right now, and uh, so man, that has really upped my cough level, and I'm coughing everywhere these days. So people are kind of a little like wary about that, but they eventually get used to it. Are you uh, are you talking to people? The old saying, shaking hands and, and kissing babies. What's that look like with the American public right now? Look, I, I understand that people are trying to trying to stay inside right now, stay in their homes, quarantine. That's why I'm coming to the homes. I'm I'm pounding on doors, uh, getting people to open those doors, and I'm saying, "Let me in. I got something to tell you." And so I, I, I try and get into as many houses as possible, and you know, like they say, kiss those babies. Try and try and smooch as many of those babies as possible during this coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, and that's been a big facet of the campaign. Like I said, is getting bridge in places where. The other candidates are too afraid to go. And for us, that's been the private homes of, of citizens. Um, <laughs> you know, Joe Biden isn't busting down the, the screen door of mom and pop in, in Florida to come right. in and give him, a, give him a hug and a kiss on the forehead and say, bridge to it for president. Especially with everyone so scared about the corona scam. For us, it's been, okay, well, how do we counteract that? And that's by getting bridge right in front of them you know the the other candidates are getting themselves on video in the living rooms of america we're getting bridge in the living rooms and that has been successful in a certain sense Mm -hmm. in the sense that we are getting bridge inside those homes unsuccessful in terms of a lot of response and in terms of the legal response we've been getting from some of you know the establishment shall we say in terms of breaking into both our, our, our rally venues and into the private homes of American citizens. But I think as we continue to do this, you know, we, we have no plans of stopping and they're going to have to come around to it. Nobody's going to stop us. And the great thing about uh, the coronavirus is that uh, whenever security detail try and, you know, sort of say like, hey, you can't be breaking into the Dallas Convention Center. Uh, all we need to do is say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to cough on you. 
I'm going to cough right on you if you don't leave me alone. And they usually uh, back away at that point, and then we get to give our speech to an empty convention center. That's great. So you don't really have to rent out the convention center. That's 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 free. Exactly. There's been some upsides. Exactly. Little things like that of like, oh, it's closed. You can't rent it. And then we say, oh, no. And then we cough on them, and then we get inside, and then we have it for free. I just picture the echoey sounds of Bridges' uh, speech. You know, he's got that, that flag that he just designed uh, right yeah. behind him. Tell me about your um, the, the flag that you've designed um, that, that's supposed to represent your, your platform, Bridge. Uh, well, it's a uh, bloody axe. It's a big bloody axe in front of a black background. And uh, I think that sort of represents, hey, we're going to really, you know, chop away at regulation in this country. And I mean... <coughs> Sorry about that. I, um, I'm smoking two cigarettes right now. The bloody axe, we think, is such a potent symbol to the American people. We think it's a real symbol of hope. I've had numerous people come up to me and when they look at that bloody axe flag or the big bloody axe painted on the side of our, of our campaign buses, when they <laughs> see that, they come up to me and their faces, I can just see the unbridled optimism that that bloody axe inspires. It's a beautiful sight to just post up on somebody's lawn and put a nice flagpole on their front lawn and raise that bloody axe flag and they'll come out and they'll be surprised uh and intrigued by who are these people on my on my lawn uh raising a bloody axe flag and then we uh get real close to them and tell them about uh, our campaign we, we actually had a, a really fun twitter challenge where we had it was called the uh, the bloody axe challenge and we had everyone take photos of themselves with their own bloody axe and post those photos on onto the internet and we had some really wonderful responses from really some really enthusiastic people um that all were really excited to share their own bloody axes that's a good thought too it's like sending those photos getting people to hashtag you know bloody axe government or whatever and sending that on government websites and on the twitter pages during this time when everybody seems to be you know frightened right now it might be a good idea to get all of your followers to send those photos to the president or or other governmental entities we've been you know, we've been having them tweet those photos of a bloody axe at, at their representatives at their senators at their congressmen um at the congresswomen uh, it seems that a lot of them actually have been sent by some of our male followers, some of our male voters, uh, supporters to a lot of the the female members of Congress and the Senate, which has been an interesting trend. But... Sort of an interesting phenomena, yeah. Also with this campaign, I mean, we we support the bo- the boys in blue, and so we've been making sure to have our followers be really sending those bloody acts pictures to the uh, police departments in their local county and their local cities so yeah they've been getting a lot of bloody axe pictures so you'd say all in all this virus is a uh, is seems to be net positive i would say we're looking at it from a net positive perspective the question is just if the american people will you know get get their heads out of the sand and get on board pick up their bloody axes and get on board the power that resonates through those empty stadiums is so overwhelming bridge what are your feelings about the regulations going on uh, people having to stay in their homes you know in the past i've i've obviously this has been a speaking point of mine but what the government is doing by shutting down everything they're shutting down businesses they're making people stay at home this is not the role of the government this is the role of individuals and as we all know individuals uh they know best on how to combat uh viruses and so how hard is it to cure a disease how hard is it to to figure out a vaccine. I'm already working on my own tonic for this. The the construction workers that are working on my house right now, they seem to have caught it. Uh, I'm already working on the tonic right now, but now I'm wondering if I should even put it out there. If it'll hurt your campaign, I don't want to do that. No, I'd probably hold off on that for a little bit. If, if you've got sort of a... Uh a vaccine sort of thing going on maybe maybe it's a tonic a it's, it's in a bottle it's uh, ingestible it's ingestible yeah that sounds like a vaccine of some kind to me i just look at the whole situation and i think to myself when has government intervention stopped any pandemic in the past name one name one i'll tell you the bubonic plague you know who stopped the bubonic plague 300 million individuals dying that was not the government that was the people and I think exactly what you're doing, Dustin, coming up with your own tonic, 
is sort of exactly the kind of innovations we need right now is people coming up with their own tonics. Just to change track, Dustin, so you're you're watching the construction of your house. Where are you right now? Uh, currently, I'm in the, the living room. Your chef has been making some delicious meals. Honestly, for yeah. me, it's it's I haven't eaten better in my entire life. This is quite a nice thing not having you not having a roommate. It's really been nice. You're at my house. Yeah. So they're still working on my house. The workers are on strike. You know, they want to get they want to get paid. When I left, you weren't at my house. You you were at a hotel. Uh, you, you've just to well, my I house. Figured... I mean, I locked the doors. You know, <laughs> I have my own chain cutters myself, so. It's very comfortable here. I feel like I call this my second home, or my first home, rather, since the one that they're building next door isn't really coming to fruition quite as fast as I expected. I figured it's a great time since you're out on the campaign trail. I brought the it's, organ. It's, it's never a good time for you to be in my house. I mean, I, you know, I mean, this is just every time I think I've gotten you out of my house, uh, you somehow crawl back in. Even when I lock the doors, even when there's a virus going on, you're somehow still back in my house. Well, you can come back whenever you want. We I know I can come back. It's my like house. You, 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 mi is su casa, as they say in Portugal. It's actually funny. That, that phrase is actually a common misconception. It's actually mi casa, mi casa, which is my house, my house, and is actually a song of lament sung by villagers when the houses burn down. Huh. It's a common misconception, actually, that has anything to do with hospitality. Mi casa, mi casa. Absolutely. It was the song that was sung when, like, the feudal lord would burn down the village and they would all, mi casa, mi casa, my house, my house. You know, oh, they would, oh they God, would scream my it. house. Uh, wow, I had no idea. <laughs> Sir Spalding, you learn something new every Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Sorry, just a most minor misconception, a common misconception. You're an expert in many things. Well, that's the nature of the publishing game. I mean, that was really why I thought I could throw my hat in the ring when it came to being a campaign manager, which is something I had never done. I've never even voted in an election before myself. I've never run for any sort of political office. I've never uh, even, like, I don't really know what, like, a city council is, but I'm running for president. The key here is that you don't need to know this stuff. It's all just a bunch of, you know, rules that have been set up by people that are rabid government fans. By all means, let's get rid of the city councils. I mean, I barely know what they are. Most people don't even know what they are. We are not part of the problem. We're part of the solution, which is going to be completely dismantling the very thing to which we are being elected. Just had a, a quick idea. Maybe you guys might want to take it. A What if you said you had the solution? I'm not finished with my tonic yet, but if you were to say, hey, this virus is making this country go nuts, what if you say, hey, we have the solution, we'll give it to you if you vote for me? To hold the tonic over the heads of the American people in order to make them vote for Bridge, that's brilliant. We've been thinking a lot about what kind of dirt do we have on the American voter? How can we bully them into voting for Bridge? What dirt do we know on every single American? And we started with that initially was digging up dirt on every single American and blackmailing them into voting for Bridge. Unfortunately, that turned out to be too laborious. Yeah, it's um, a lot. There's a yeah. lot. Of it was very time consuming to dig up dirt on every individual American. You know, to go away from using the stick to using the carrot and dangling sort of this tonic in front of them. Uh, but achieving the same end is a very that, that's something we hadn't considered I, I like that quite a bit Dustin I like that quite a bit I have a few things a few projects going on but that's certainly one of them one, I mean I guess one of them would be burning down this house right now you, you, as you had mentioned I should be me house me burning, house I should burn down the house burning down the house well Sir so Spalding suggested I should do this you know I didn't, saying... su I didn't suggest you burn it but I really don't feel strongly enough about it either way so I suppose you can uh, I, I, I feel pretty strongly about my house um, I, I would really suggest Suggest you don't burn the That's house down. That's I'm almost excited about this new awakening where I burn your house down and build a new. I could build something better, I promise. You promise that you'll build something better than my house after you burn it down. I mean, I've got things in that house. I have important things in that house. In many ways, though, Bridge, now that I'm hearing Dustin out, it does sort of represent a microcosm of what you're trying to achieve with your campaign. No, there's no... It, we, there's pictures of my father in that house. Pictures that I cherish... I cherish those pictures of my father, and they're in drawers filled in the basement. And if you burn the house down, those pictures of my father will go away. You can't burn the house down. I mean, do you want the tonic or not? I want the tonic, but I want the pictures of my father. I burn down the house. I'll give you the tonic. You tell the American public that you have the cure for the virus, and then you win the election. I'm flying back. Spalding, I'm flying back. And no, I'm no, you Bridge, we need you on the campaign trail. We can't have you flying back right now to burn the body down. Well, I house. need those pictures of my father. 
I don't want him burning down my house and thus destroying the pictures of my father. I cherish those pictures I, I hate more than anything. Yeah, Bridge. I mean, you are scheduled for over a dozen bust ins and greet ems in Dayton, Ohio this week. And if you're going all the way back to your house to prevent him from burning him down, you're not going to be able to bust into those living rooms and, and, I can, and I greet them. I, I'll bust into living rooms on the way there. I don't care. You can't burn down my house. I want the pictures of my father are too important. I don't know where these pictures are. I'm looking for them. You're I, not supposed to see those nobody's supposed to see those except for me well i guess this is sort of a cautionary tale about leaving things in your home once again uh, derailed something that uh, you'll live in the white house you, you know there's plenty of photos in the white house white house is a dump the white house is a dump i yeah. agree with that that's something we've already been talk- discussing is how do we burn down the white house because that thing is a real trash pile i mean God. you might want to burn so you're, you're oh, worried God. about white is so gauche plus i hear the white house uh it literally stinks from what I've heard. So I think we're we're doing everybody a favor. It's very, very smelly. Ever since FDR, he would drag his lame legs all through the house and skin particles would fall everywhere. That created an odor from his decaying flesh that has never been erased. I talk to these lobbyists all the time. They walk through the streets of Washington, D.C. And they, see, they have to pass by the White House to get to K Street. They avoid the White House because it, it reeks. Because it really smells. I remember I, I heard a story about the filming of National Treasure 2 when they were on location at the White House for the filming of the film that John Voigt reportedly keeled over a dozen times because the odor was so pungent. They ended up actually having to film all of his scenes in the White House with a double because he couldn't even hack the smell. He couldn't hack the smell, but he's you know he, he's a master computer hacker. His daughter taught him. As well. I know people don't realize that, actually, that John Voigt was one of the founders of Napster as well as a, uh, an accomplished computer programmer in his own right. People forget that, I think, because his, his film career kind of overshadows his work in tech. He uh, met a teenage Bill Gates on the set of Midnight Cowboy, and uh, he just never turned back. I always forgot that Bill Gates was a script was the script supervisor for Midnight Cowboy. I always forgot that. Sir Spalding, your knowledge of American history, it, it's really beyond anything I've ever imagined. You're really great. Your wife must... Must love all your little quips and all the things that you have to say. Oh, oh don't don't you dare bring her up. <laughs> don't you dare. Don't you dare. Uh, um, I'm just ribbing at you. My, for those of you who don't know, know, my wife Henry is does deceased. does not like to talk uh, about his uh, wife. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess you, yeah, I guess you, you left your wife six, last four years. six feet away from you. You know, more like six feet under. More like six feet under. Yeah. <laughs> she was practicing uh, uh, social distancing for the last four years. She's yeah. way ahead of the curve. Yeah. Way ahead of the curve. Yeah. Uh, yes. No. <laughs> No, uh, for those of you, uh, she fell off a catamaran. We never recovered the body. So this is obviously all in jest, all in, all in good And fun. you were the only person to have witnessed that. Absolutely, that yes. Yes, it was very, very tragic what I saw of her dying on board that catamaran. They're doing and a documentary on you, I believe. Is that is this true? I have heard about this as well. I think it's going to be full of a lot of sort of wacky conspiracies, you know, about the nature of the events surrounding my wife's death, not disappearance, death. And um, I'm a little disappointed that they're going forward with it. I don't think it was strange at all to take my wife on a catamaran cruise in those conditions with no record of the trip and no one else aboard. Um, I thought that was romantic. And the fact that she had recently inherited her father's fortune uh, and that she had no other living relatives other than myself, is circumstantial. Because I'm, I'm very sad. Me, and I think know. the working title is Catamaran King. Because obviously, you're a big fan of catamarans. I mean, like, that's... Absolutely. Oh, God. I love my catamaran. Now, if they had said I had to, I was choosing between the catamaran and my wife, then I'd say, you've got a story there. Yeah, I did. Absolutely. But it was never... A, I was never picking between the two. Uh, I was never pick, pick, picking between any of them. That's, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous. But no, love... Oh... I love my catamarans. I mean, it's two boats in one. It's really something special. Now, I wanted to quickly go back to your depression over your wife's death. How are the therapy appointments going? You had a cat. Well, how's the cat doing? Again, to fill in those of you who are listening, following my wife's death, I was very publicly very, very sad. And um, I had a psychiatrist that I was seeing for, for therapy reasons because of how sad I was. Very publicly seeing this therapist and the therapist recommended to me that instead of continuing our sessions, I should adopt a, a cat to whom I would tell all of my very sad feelings about m- my wife's demise. And um, so that's what I did. I bought a cat and have been talking to that cat ever since. Some of the very best conversations 
I have ever had have been with that cat. His name is Randall. He is such a patient listener. And thankfully, I have gotten his testimony notarized by a public notary. So legally in court, um, I have a testimony from him that obviously I'm the only one that can really communicate with him well. So I've translated it for him that really expresses in his own words what I've said to him as evidence of the, my innocence. Yeah, this is uh, this has been uh, kind of a talking point that, you know, we've discussed. I haven't been a huge fan of you talking about this cat on the campaign trail because uh, it makes you seem batshit crazy. But, uh, you know, I sometimes you got to just accept that uh, your campaign manager is going to be talking about a cat that he regularly talks to. I like to think it sort of humanizes their campaign in a lot of ways, honestly. And I think when they go, oh, wait, no, he talks to a cat. He's after talking to having, an animal. He talks to an animal after having lost his wife under very mysterious circumstances. That's just like me. And I think that's something that it's quirky. It's actually fun. helpful. So all in all, everything's going really well in the campaign. This is great to hear. Uh, I'm still... <laughs> When you choose a, a, a running partner, uh, you know, I'm here. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely not going to be happening, especially now that you're uh, attempting to burn down my house. Uh, I think that's not something the American people want to see in a vice president is uh, an arsonist. You didn't hear you didn't hear it here, but we're almost certainly reaching out to Chrissy Teigen. Oh, yeah. that's... you didn't hear it from here. Um, but yeah, no, we are really, uh, you know, coming at people with this bloody axe in uh in this campaign and i think uh people are going to be really shocked as to what we're capable of we want to shock the voter people are going to look at the bloody axe of bridge to it and see a new vision for america they're going to look at that bloody axe and say oh my god help which is uh sort of we're, we're just kind of playing around with that as the uh campaign slogan oh my god help oh my god help bridge do it 2020 me country me country so thanks so much for listening everyone this was a great <laughs> i almost feel like i'm i was just doing a, a new segment maybe i'll try to become a pundit one day you, you know we can have some great conversations when you make it to the white house or whatever you decide to replace it with i was thinking maybe the brown house just paint it brown I think, mm, tear it down and build a big brown box i think would be uh <laughs> would be nice I think that'd be a good look for Washington, D.C., just a towering brown box. Anyway, thank you thank you for listening to Business Money Hacks, and remember to be voting for Bridge Stewart. Thank you much so much for having me on, gentlemen. And yes, Bridge Stewart 2020. Stewart Hahn 2020. Oh, God help. Stewart Hahn 2020. Let's make 2020. this reality, folks. Let's do this. The race for the brown box.